as I've said to several other audiences recently, I think we really only have two alternatives at this point. We're either going to discuss nuclear war and do something to prevent it, or we're going to experience nuclear war, which is going to be even worse than listening to what I have to say tonight. Um, a generation ago, back in the 1980s, everybody understood how dangerous nuclear weapons were and understood how great the possibility that they would be used was. And as a result of that, millions of people in the United States, in Europe, in the Soviet Union, took action to try to do something about this. And the thing that is most significant about this, excuse me, <coughs> is that that political action was successful. In the 1980s, we were engaged, the United States and the Soviet Union, in a vigorous arms race. Each side already had something like 30,000 nuclear warheads. And we were each adding 3,000 warheads a year to that arsenal. The United States at that point had targeted Moscow with 400 nuclear warheads. I mean, the entire enterprise had taken on a, 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 an insane quality that's really hard to, to get. I mean, the, the kinds of movies that were made at the time, like Dr. Strangelove, really did capture how crazy this all was. But despite the craziness, you know, this continued. The governments were intent on these policies. In 1981, Ronald Reagan was elected, um, 1980, he took office in January of 81, as the most hawkish president we've ever had with regards to nuclear weapons. He believed that we could fight and win a nuclear war in Europe, and actually planned to do that. <coughs> I'm so sorry. He, um, You know, he instructed the Pentagon to procure and deploy weapons that were specifically designed to fight war. They weren't just to deter it, they were to fight it and to win. In the summer of 1983, we deployed in um, Germany Pershing missiles that could destroy Moscow in six minutes, uh, thereby completely eliminating any warning time that the Russians, the Soviets had. And we were headed on a path to war. George Kistiakowsky, who had been the science advisor for President Eisenhower, said at the beginning of the 1980s, we will not live to 1990. And when we got to 1990 and the war world had not ended, some people said, well, gee, this guy was pretty alarmist. But the more we learn about what happened in 1980, the more accurate his prediction actually turns out to be. Because we came so close so many times, the analysis was right. We were headed on a path to war. The reason why we're here today is not because we, had, we were doing the right things. It's because we were unbelievably lucky, time after time after time. And so in that setting, with that incredible danger, millions of people formed political action groups in the United States, in Europe, in the Soviet Union, and demanded that the governments change course, that they end the arms race, that they stop building new nuclear weapons, that they freeze the arms race. And that movement was successful. Three years after he took office in January of 1981, promising to make it possible for the US to fight and win a nuclear war, three years later, in January of 1984, Ronald Reagan gave a State of the Union speech in which he said, nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought. It was a 180 degree turnabout in the policy that he had espoused. And it was such a complete break from what he'd said previously that we, we missed it. We, we all thought this was just a, you know, a campaign speech for the 1984 presidential campaign. But it turns out it wasn't. He had really changed his thinking about nuclear weapons. And the Soviet leadership had as well. And as a result of the political action, the educational efforts that were undertaken by civil society across the world, the Cold War arms race, was there was a freeze. The arms race did end. And I believe as a result of that work, the world was saved and we did not have a nuclear war. The problem is that when the Cold War ended, we all began to act as if the entire problem had gone away. And it hadn't. We did disband huge numbers of nuclear weapons. There used to be something like 70,000. We disbanded, dismantled more than 50,000 of those but 15,000 of them remain in the world. And for about 20 years after the end of the Cold War, it was very hard to get anyone to pay attention to this problem. 
we all just acted as if it had gone away. It never really did. Even during that period of time, there was always the danger that there might be an accidental nuclear war. And on one occasion in 1995, we came within minutes of blowing up the planet again. This was six years after the Berlin Wall came down, at a time when there was no significant conflict any place uh, and no real tension between the United States and Russia. But a, 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 a misinterpreted radar report nearly led to nuclear war. That was then. That was during the period of time when the Cold War was felt to be over. Now we're in a different phase. Over the last six to eight years, many things have taken place in the world which have increased the danger of nuclear war. And I want to talk to you about literally eight specific things that we need to be worried about that are all increasing the danger. Five of these relate to geopolitical flashpoints. The first of these is the one I was just alluding to, the situation between the United States and Russia, where relations are the worst they have been in at least 28 years since the end of the Cold War. We were told during most, most of this period that we didn't need to worry about this at all, that there was no danger the US and Russia would go to war. I was at a meeting at the State Department in uh, August of 2014 with Rose Gautamola, who was the Under Secretary of State for Disarmament, in which she told me the US government doesn't even do contingency plannings for a possible war with Russia. It just is not something we think about. Well, events that were starting to unfold then, and which have developed more fully since, I think have shown how wrong that sense of complacency was. We now understand that the conflict in Syria, or the conflict in Ukraine, or perhaps some incident in, in the Baltics, where, where we play nuclear chicken with Soviet, with Russian forces all the time, an event in any of these theaters could in fact lead to war between the United States and Russia that would very quickly turn to nuclear war. That's the first of the, of the flashpoints we need to worry about. Second is the situation with the United States and China. The relations here are the worst they have been in at least 40 years. During the last years of the Cold War, China was essentially an ally of the United States. It would function as an honorary member of NATO in the confrontation with the Soviet Union. And that is not the situation anymore. We are engaged in a, an increasingly tense economic competition with China, and now we are engaged in a series of mutual provocative actions in the South China Sea where US and Chinese naval forces play chicken with each other all the time. And it's a very dangerous situation, and it too could lead to conflict and to the use of nuclear weapons. The third geographic area that we need to think about is the one which is most on our minds at the moment, which is Korea. And even before the announcement this afternoon that the summit may actually not take place, um, I have been urging people to understand that even if the summit does take place, we are not at all out of the woods. Uh, I'm not a Korea expert, but all of the experts that I've been reading, and there's been a great deal of stuff in the newspapers and magazines over the last few weeks, they're all in agreement that the North Koreans have no intention of giving up their nuclear weapons. And yet, President Trump seems to think that's what's going to happen when they sit down in Singapore. And when he understands that that isn't going to happen, it is not at all clear what is going to happen. President Trump, at the moment, seems to be enamored with the idea that he's going to be the great peacemaker, that this will be his great legacy. Maybe he'll win the Nobel Prize this year. He'll bring, do something none of his predecessors have been able to do in the last 70 years, bring peace to Korea. That may be the direction he's wanting to move in. But there's no way in the world that he's going to come back to the United States with a treaty with North Korea that is weaker than the treaty with Iran he just tore up. And sitting at his side throughout this process will be John Bolton, who has made quite clear what he thinks should happen in Korea. He has stated publicly that he is glad the summit will take place because it will foreshorten the period of diplomacy and let us get on to the real solution that is needed to this problem. So this is a terribly dangerous situation and one with a very, very short potential time frame. We could be looking at very bad things happening in Korea in less than a month. The fourth geopolitical area is one which I think is every bit as dangerous, although it does not get any attention at all here in the United States. And that's the situation in South Asia. India and Pakistan each have 130 nuclear weapons. They have fought four wars since independence in 1946. There is fighting every single day on the border between India and Pakistan in Kashmir. 
It's usually quite low level, a few rounds of artillery fire, some mortar rounds, some rifle fire, a couple of people killed on either side of the border. But no one who follows events in South Asia, I think, would be at all surprised to wake up tomorrow and learn that overnight the fighting had escalated and India and Pakistan were now engaged in something that was turning into the fifth war between them. And what we now know about their nuclear policies and their military policies is that if there is a fifth war, it will almost certainly involve the use of nuclear weapons. India is much more powerful than Pakistan in terms of conventional forces. And in response to that, the Pakistanis have articulated a very explicit doctrine. If Indian tank forces cross the border into Pakistan, Pakistan will use tactical nuclear weapons on the battlefield against them. And in response to that policy, the Indians have been equally clear. If Pakistan uses tactical nuclear weapons against military forces in the field, India will use strategic nuclear forces against industrial and urban targets in Pakistan. We're not paying any attention to this problem at all here in the United States. And none of the other nuclear powers outside of South Asia seem to be paying much attention to it either, even though this conflict poses a direct threat to all of us, as I will talk about in a few minutes. The fifth geopolitical flashpoint is the one that David was referring to a few minutes ago, and that's the, the totally unnecessary re-escalation of the crisis in Iran. Uh, this deal was not perfect, but it appears to have been quite good. Four years ago, before the deal was concluded, Benjamin Netanyahu, who is the most vocal critic of the deal, was telling everyone that Iran would have nuclear weapons in three to six months. Well, it's four years later and they don't have nuclear weapons. And the intelligence community in the United States and in all the other parties to this agreement and the Atomic Energy, International Atomic Energy Agency, which is in, in charged with enforcing, inspecting this agreement, all conclude that the Iranians are living up to their terms and that they're not developing nuclear weapons. The treaty was working. Perhaps it won't now. We don't know how the Iranians will react. They're still trying to figure out what their response will be. So these are the five geopolitical flashpoints that have all of them deteriorated dramatically in the last few years and in each case raised the possibility of nuclear war. There are three other factors we need to be concerned with. First is the possibility of cyber terrorism. We used to think that the worst thing that a terrorist group could do would be to get hold of a single nuclear warhead, probably a relatively small one, something on the order of the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima, and use that bomb to destroy or to attack a major city like New York or Moscow or, or Bombay or, or Tel Aviv. That could still happen, and it would be quite catastrophic if it did. But we now understand that terrorists have at least potentially the ability to do something far worse. They could hack into the command and control systems of a nuclear power and trigger the launch of that country's nuclear weapons. Or perhaps, more likely, create a false alert so that the country that was being hacked believed that its adversary had launched nuclear missiles against it and thereby trick the country that was being hacked into launching a retaliatory strike against an attack that was not even taking place. This is an absolute nightmare which haunts people in the Pentagon uh, there's a large cybersecurity effort here in the United States, but despite our best efforts, Pentagon computers get hacked into every day many times. And there is a real danger that at some point, uh, malevolent hackers of the worst sort will figure out how to get in to the systems which control our nuclear weapons. The seventh of the factors which we need to consider is one which people don't often think about in terms of nuclear war, but we need to. And that's climate change. You know, we have been told by the United States and by all of the other nuclear weapons countries that they all want to get rid of their nuclear arsenals, but the conditions just aren't right. The world is too dangerous right now. And at some point in the future, when the world is safer, we'll get rid of the weapons. Well, the problem is the world isn't getting safer. Climate change is making large portions of the planet increasingly difficult for people to live in. And the populations which live there are going to find themselves competing for food and for water. And that's no matter what we do now. Even if we do everything that we're supposed to to curb greenhouse emissions, 
there will be further destruction of the climate for at least another 20 to 30 to 40 years. And as a result of that, there will be increased conflict. There will be increased conflict within civil society as people within countries fight for water and for food. There will be conflict between nations over these resources. And if nuclear weapons are available, there is the increased likelihood that these weapons will be used. Again, particularly true in South Asia, the Middle East, the areas where there are nuclear weapons which are going to be most adversely affected by climate change in the near term. The final factor that we need to think about is one which I think is going to be more transient, but it is one which we need to think about. Uh, and that is the simple fact of the presidency of Donald Trump. And I do not think this is a partisan comment that I'm making at this point. The critique of Donald Trump's role as Commander-in-Chief of our nuclear forces comes overwhelmingly from within his own party. Before the 2016 election, scores of Republican security experts signed a statement in which they said that he lacked the judgment, the temperament, and the knowledge to be in charge of a nuclear arsenal. His former Secretary of State, after a conference in which Trump put forward his views of what our nuclear arsenal should be, famously called him a moron. And it is reported that his recently departed um, uh, national security, excuse me, not his departed, his current national security, current, excuse me, chief of staff, has descri descri described him as an idiot. Um, whatever one thinks of his other policies, of his comportment in other areas of his presidency, there is a strong criticism from within the security uh, community of his own party that he is not somebody who should be in charge of a nuclear arsenal. We have said in the United States for decades that it would be a disaster if even a single nuclear weapon got into the wrong hands, by which we meant at the time a rogue state or a terrorist group. We have turned 6,800 nuclear warheads over to Donald Trump, and that is a significant fact in the world today, and we have to confront that. So given the likelihood that nuclear weapons might be used, it behooves us to understand what's going to happen if these weapons are deployed. And looking around the room here, I suspect that most of the people here have significant memories from the Cold War, and at one point probably had a pretty good understanding of what nuclear war would be. But most of us who knew this during the Cold War have really pushed this out of mind and really don't remember information that we should know about. There's also been a fair amount of information generated in the last decade about what a limited nuclear war would be. And so let me talk first about that. Um, we used to think that it was only a major conflict between the United States and Soviet Union that would pose a threat to the world as a whole. We now understand that even a very limited nuclear war, as might take place between India and Pakistan, would be a catastrophe not just for South Asia, but for the entire planet. The studies that have been done are all based on a scenario in which India and Pakistan each use about 50 Hiroshima-sized bombs against urban targets in the other country. This is probably a very conservative scenario. As I mentioned before, each of these countries has 130 warheads, not 50. And most of those weapons are two to three times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. Some of them as much as 10 times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. But the data has been generated using this more conservative scenario. And so let me just share that data with you. The immediate effects in South Asia of this conflict are incredibly horrible. In the first week, 20 million people die from the explosions, the fires, and the short-term uh, radiation effects. But, and to, and to put that in context, during all of World War II, about 50 million people died across the entire planet over eight years. So we would have a comparable event taking place, but in the course of a single week and in one relatively small geographic, part, geographic region. But as catastrophic as these local effects in South Asia would be, they're only a small part of the story. A hundred Hiroshima-sized bombs detonated over a hundred urban targets create a hundred firestorms. And they put about six and a half million tons of soot in the upper atmosphere, causing worldwide climate disruption, not just in South Asia, but across the entire planet. The dust cloud spreads over the course of about three days. It blocks out the sun. It drops temperatures. 
It cuts precipitation because when the air is cooler, less water evaporates from the oceans to fall back. It shortens the growing season. It causes an increase in ozone reaching the ground level, because, excuse me, of ultraviolet light reaching the, the ground level because the upper level ozone layer is depleted. And as a result of all of these forms of climate disruption, there is a catastrophic decline in food production across the entire planet. Here in the United States, the crops that we've looked at are, fall by 15% or more for a full decade, not just for a year or two. In China, the, uh, the rice crop, the most important food crop in the country, falls by 16 to 17% for a full decade. The wheat crop, which is the second most important food crop, falls by 31% for a full decade. The world is not in a position at this time where it can absorb declines in food production of this magnitude. There are already 825 million people on the planet who are severely malnourished, who get by on about 17 to 1800 calories a day, which is just enough to maintain their body mass and enable them to do a little bit of physical work to grow food or to gather food or to do some kind of work that lets them buy food. These people cannot tolerate any further decline in their food consumption. There are 300 million people on the planet who are well nourished today, but live in countries where most of the food is imported. And under the conditions that would exist after this limited nuclear war, those food imports would not be available because food exporting countries would be hoarding their food to feed their own populations. These are some very rich countries that we're talking about. Japan, South Korea, <coughs> Taiwan, most of the countries in the Middle East. 300 million people. In addition, there are about a billion people in China who are well-nourished today, live in a country where most of the food is grown in country, but who are poor, who live on less than $5 a day. And when food prices skyrocket in the face of this decline in food production, and they will, these people are not going to be able to afford to buy food. It will not be accessible to them. And so we have concluded that as a result of this limited war confined just to South Asia, as many as two billion people across the entire planet would be put at risk of starvation. The death of two billion people over a decade, if that were to occur, would not be the extinction of our species. It would be the end of our civilization. No civilization in history has ever withstood a shock of this magnitude. And there is no reason to think that the very fragile, interconnected economic system, which we all depend on, would survive this kind of upheaval. We all saw what happened to the world economy just as a result of a housing bubble here in the United States. Imagine what would happen with this kind of disruption. That's a limited nuclear war. That's a war that involves less than 0.03% of the world's current nuclear arsenals. Let's talk for a few minutes about what will happen if there's a large-scale nuclear war. And I wanted to start this section of my talk by describing to you what a modern nuclear attack on a large city would look like. Most of us have images of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in our mind. And those images are important. They're an important warning of the destructive power that nuclear weapons can have. But the main thing that we need to know about Hiroshima and Nagasaki is that they do not begin to prepare us for the level of destruction that today's nuclear weapons would cause. Because a big city like New York would not be targeted with one Hiroshima-sized bomb. It would most likely be targeted with 15 to 20 bombs, 30 to 50 times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. We don't know for sure. We don't know exactly what US or Russian targeting strategy is, although I have learned recently that the United States continues to target Moscow with over 100 nuclear weapons. And that does not include the British, the French, and the Chinese nuclear weapons, which are also targeted on Moscow. So the model that we've been using that a big city like New York gets 15 to 20 may be a significant underestimate of what would actually happen. But I'm going to talk about that scenario, and I'm going to use a model to describe the destruction. I'm going to use a one single very large nuclear explosion, uh, 20, 20 megatons. Uh, the megatonnage is a little bit bigger than we would expect New York to receive. The destruction I'm going to describe is actually somewhat less because you cause more damage by having multiple smaller explosions spread out more efficiently, if you will, over a large area. But I think the model is, is adequate for us to understand the magnitude of the destructive force that these weapons have. 
Within a thousandth of a second of the detonation of this bomb, a fireball would form, reaching out for two miles in every direction, four miles across. Within this area, the temperature would rise to 20 million degrees, which is hotter than the surface of the sun, and everything would be vaporized. The buildings, the trees, the people, the upper level of the Earth itself would disappear. To a distance of four miles in every direction, the explosion would create winds greater than 600 miles per hour and blast pressures greater than 25 pounds per square inch. Mechanical forces of that magnitude destroy anything that people build. Underground shelters collapse when they are exposed to this kind of, of blast pressure. To a distance of six miles in every direction, the heat would be so intense that automobiles would melt. And to a distance of 16 miles in every direction, the heat would still be so great that everything flammable would burn. Cloth, paper, gasoline, heating oil, plastic, wood, it would all ignite into hundreds of thousands of fires, which over the next half hour would coalesce into a firestorm, 32 miles across, 800 square miles. Within this entire area, the temperature would rise to 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit. All of the oxygen would be consumed, and every living thing would die. The bacteria and the viruses would die. It would be sterilized of all life. In the case of New York City, we're talking about something between 12 and 15 million people. And if this attack were part of a large-scale war between the United States and Russia, this same level of destruction would occur in every major city in both countries. And if NATO were drawn into the conflict, most of the major cities in Canada and Europe as well. All told, perhaps 300 to 500 million people dead in a day. But again, this is not the whole story. A limited war in South Asia puts six and a half million tons of soot into the upper atmosphere, drops temperatures across the planet about one point, about two degrees Fahrenheit. A large war between the United States and Russia, using just the weapons which are still deployed under the New START Treaty, the 1,550 warheads on each side. That war puts 150 million tons of soot into the upper atmosphere. And that drops temperatures across the entire planet an average of 14 degrees Fahrenheit. Here in Colorado, in the interior regions of North America, and also in the interior regions of Eurasia, the temperatures drop 45 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. We create conditions which have not been seen on this planet in 18,000 years since the coldest moment of the last ice age. We essentially create our own man-made ice age. And under those conditions, all of the ecosystems which have evolved in the last 12,000 years would all collapse. Food production across the planet would stop. The vast majority of the human race would starve to death. And under these conditions, it is possible that we would, in fact, become extinct as a species. Now, it is important that we understand this is not just some scenario cooked up to be the plot of a grade B movie. This is the danger which we have faced throughout the nuclear weapons era, which we face today, and which we will continue to face every day until these weapons are removed from the planet. We have been living on borrowed time. We have been incredibly lucky. And we cannot expect our luck to continue indefinitely. So why talk about this? Because what I have described <clears throat> is the future that will be if we don't take action. But it is not the future that must be. Nuclear weapons are not a force of nature. They are not an act of God. We built these with our own hands, and we know how to take them apart. We've already dismantled more than 50,000 of them. We simply have not made the political decision to dismantle the 15,000 that will remain. And that we must do. Fortunately, a movement is growing around the world to do just that, to bring about the abolition of these weapons. Over the last four to five years, the countries of the world which do not possess nuclear weapons have risen up and said, enough. 
we are not going to let you hold our citizens hostage to your crazy nuclear policies. You know, under the Non-Proliferation Treaty that the United States entered in 1969, the countries which did not have nuclear weapons pledged not to build them. But the countries which had nuclear weapons pledged to disarm, to negotiate the elimination of those arsenals. And that they have not done. And the rest of the world has finally lost patience. In a series of international conferences, the first which ever took place, government leaders from around the world gathered, first in Oslo, Norway in 2013, then in Nairit, Mexico, and Vienna in two separate meetings in 2014, and considered the kind of information that I've been presenting to you tonight, the medical consequences of nuclear war. And at the end of those conferences, they decided to come to the United Nations and propose a new treaty. And on July 7th of last year, that treaty was adopted by vote at the United Nations, by a vote of 122 to 1. It's the Treaty on the uh, Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And it says that the possession, construction, deployment, transportation, or financing of nuclear weapons is now illegal under international law. It is an enormous step forward, one which was has brought great pressure on the nuclear weapon states, but unfortunately, one which they have resisted very vigorously. None of the nuclear weapon states took part in these negotiations. None voted for the treaty, and none are expected to, shine, to sign it in the short term. And so the struggle moves now from the non-nuclear weapon states, although they have much work still to do, but it moves very significantly to we who live in the states that actually possess these weapons. Because what we need now to do is to change the policy of our government. And again, in this regard, there, is some very encouraging, there are some very encouraging developments to report. Uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility, the medical group that I belong to, working with the Union of Concerned Scientists, Soko Gakkai International, a Buddhist organization, and many other national religious, scientific, and medical organizations, has launched a campaign called Back from the Brink, a call to prevent nuclear war. This campaign is modeled very explicitly and self-consciously on the freeze campaign of the early 1980s. At that time, small groups of people in communities around the country took a stand and issued a statement that the arms race, the, the US and Soviet Union should freeze the arms race. They should stop building new nuclear weapons. And that call, articulated, endorsed by churches, by unions, by city councils, by town meetings, and, uh, by um, all kinds of civic organizations created a national consensus that the Cold War arms race should stop. And that became national policy. We are trying to do the same thing. We've put together a simple statement of what US nuclear policy should be at this time. It's not one point, it's got five points, but they're fairly simple and straightforward. The call says that the United States should announce that it will never use nuclear weapons first something which we have not been willing to do in the past. It says that the United States should take its weapons off hair trigger alert. Most of our nuclear warheads are on missiles that can be fired in 15 minutes. This is a crazy legacy of the Cold War. If we do decide someday that we want to blow up the world, we don't have to make the decision in 15 minutes' time. We can take a whole day to think it over and to say if we really want to do that. So we should take the weapons off hair trigger alert. Number three. We should end the unchecked authority of the President of the United States to launch nuclear war. The Constitution says that only Congress can declare war. But the way things are now, the President of the United States, on his or her, if we are lucky enough to have a woman president someday, can make that decision without any consultation with the Cabinet, with the Congress, or without anybody else being involved in the decision-making process. That should change. Fourth. The United States should abandon the current plan to spend $1.7 trillion over the next 30 years, enhancing every aspect of our nuclear arsenal. We are planning to build new submarines, new missiles for the submarines, new bombers, new ground-based missiles, new cruise launch missiles, new warheads. We're going to spend $1.7 trillion in this incredible spending spree. We should not do that. And fifth and most important, the call says that the United States should lead a global effort to negotiate a treaty with all nine nuclear weapon states that will set forward a timetable 
and enforcement and verification procedures under which all of the existing weapons will be dismantled. This is what we have said is our goal, a world free of nuclear weapons. We have never worked for it. It is time that we do that. We may not be successful. We may not be able to get the Russians to join us in this effort. But we have never tried, and it is time that we do that. So the strategy behind this call to prevent nuclear war is the same as the strategy of the freeze movement. We are going to all kinds of local organizations, asking them to endorse this policy and to bring their endorsement to the attention of their congressmen and their senators and the president. And the hope is that over the next three years, we can create a new consensus of what nuclear policy should be in this country so that the government which takes office in January of 2021 is truly committed to a fundamental change in US nuclear policy, to the active pursuit of a world free of nuclear weapons, and that the president who takes office at that time will fill the administration, the State Department, the Defense Department, the National Security Council, with people who share that vision and are committed to achieving this, not just as a rhetorical device, but as the central tenet of US security policy. It's an extraordinarily ambitious goal that we have set ourselves, but it is not an impossible goal. We have done this once before. We changed US nuclear policy in three years between 1981 and 1984. And all we are saying is that we need to do again what we have already done once. In talking to you about this stuff tonight, I have placed, I think, a very great responsibility on your shoulders. Once we know about the danger that we face, we can't ignore it. We have to take action. You know, if you see somebody fall down on the street in front of you, you can't just step over them. You have to do something. And if you know that your entire world, everything that you cherish and love and value is at risk, you have to do something about it. And this responsibility is a very great burden. I think there's no way of avoiding that. It's a burden which sits on all of us and will sit on all of us until we are successful in resolving this situation. But if it is a burden, I think we should also view this as a very great gift that we've been given. Every one of us wants to do something good with our life. Those of us living today have been given the opportunity to save the world. And there is absolutely nothing better that anyone can ever do with his or her life. It says, it's written in Deuteronomy, that God said, Behold, I have set before you life and death. Therefore, choose life that you and your children might live. Today, that is literally the choice before all of humanity. And so let us pledge that we will choose wisely and that we will act with courage and perseverance so that indeed we and our children might live. Thank you. As a member of this World Affairs Council, can I make a motion that we uh, adopt a resolution that he has just recommended and inform and take this resolution to our congressmen and our senators as a statement from us? I didn't have to suggest that to you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that would be a wonderful thing to do. And, and building on that, I hope that in addition, each of you will think about the other organizations that you belong to that you can also activate. You know, what church groups, what civic groups? Do you belong to a Rotary Club? Are you part of a professional association? Are you part of a, of a labor union? Um, that's the kind of work we need to do. We, we want national organizations to endorse this, but we even more want local groups to do it because that's who your congressman is going to listen to. If a whole bunch of, com of organizations in this community say this is what US nuclear policy should be and this is important, that's the kind of thing that's going to really change the way you know, a representative in Congress thinks and acts and votes. I second that resolution. 
it's, it seems to me like the issue of how much denuclearization there can be is the lowest common denominator. So we may choose to follow a path that if our adversaries, if the Russians or the Chinese choose not to, we are going to be limited in our ability to de-weaponize to the extent that they choose to. So I'm wondering how you address that and, and what the solution to that problem is. Yeah, um, I don't think that we should be talking about the United States unilaterally disarming. Uh, number one, I think it's a political non-starter. But number two, I'm not even sure if we could do, if we did have the political will, that that would be wise. Because we need to get rid of their weapons too. And we need to use our weapons for leverage to get rid of the rest of the world's weapons. Um, I think this needs to be a multilateral process. Uh, the US and Russia, because of the enormous size of their arsenals, they have 95% of the nuclear weapons, uh, may need to take some bilateral steps first to get their arsenals down to the size of the other nuclear weapon states before everybody joins in the negotiations. But this has to be a multilateral process. I think there are some things that any one of the nuclear weapon states could do unilaterally to help move that, that process forward. The four preliminary bullet points in the call resolution those are steps the United States could take, uh, which, which would not in any way uh, compromise our security, and which would indicate our sincerity, our, our real determination to move in this direction, and could help to prod, perhaps, the Russians to do the same. That's what ha has happened in the past. There's good historical precedent. In the mid-1980s, Gorbachev suspended unilaterally Soviet nuclear testing and challenged the United States to, to match it. Uh, it was a six-month suspension. We didn't. At the end of six months, he extended this suspension for another six months. He finally was able to bring the United States along. Uh, in 1989, uh, the first President Bush unilaterally withdrew U.S. tactical nuclear weapons from Europe so that the Russians could then feel empowered to take their tactical weapons out of the Warsaw Pact countries that were all about to split off from the Warsaw Pact. Um, so there, there's good precedent for some unilateral steps, but this has to be done as a, as, a, as a mutual negotiation among all the nuclear, nuclear powers. Very good question, thank you. I've got one more question here, then I want to get to the other side of the room and we'll come back to this side. Thank you. I wonder if it would be possible for us to get a, a digital copy of your presentation that we might get to uh, leaders in our community uh, our congressmen, for example, our newspapers, because the, uh, the number of facts you laid out are, uh, well, they're frightening, but they're, uh, they're voluminous. And uh, it would be hard for uh, those of us who are not within your community to, uh, to hit on all of those. Um, I think you've been taping the event tonight? Yes. So, so there, there is a, a digital record of tonight available. There are also some shorter versions for in, you know, occasions when a shorter version is more appropriate that are available online. If you Google my name on you, and YouTube or my name in videos, uh, there's, a, there's a TED talk and a couple of other talks that people could use it for, for that kind of, of reason, of purpose. Thank you. Thank you. That is a great plug for our website. If you go to the Colorado Foothills World Affairs Council org, Ken Shower, one of our volunteers, does post our programs on YouTube, and you can share those with friends. and And please do. We encourage you to do that. Hi. Thank you for presenting for your dedication uh, towards this cause. I was wondering if you might uh, provide some perspective as as. Uh, from your perspective, uh, what's been the most egregious example of uh, the transport and, and sharing of nuclear weapons uh, uh, within the world, uh, perhaps from uh, one current state owner to another, but also at a more, if you will, local or terrorist uh, level? Well, you know, all of the nuclear weapon states, or many of the nuclear weapon states have, have been guilty of really dumb things if their goal is to prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Uh, the French provided the Israelis with the experimental reactor that they used to build their bomb. Um, the Canadians and the Americans both provided nuclear technology to the Indians, which enabled them to build their bomb. Uh, I believe the Russians provided the technology to the North Koreans that enabled them to build their bomb. So there have been a lot of examples of really hard to understand uh, uh, maneuvers being carried out by nuclear weapon states which claim to fear nuclear proliferation. 
Um, but, you know, it's interesting. The, we worry a lot about proliferation, and rightly so. The more nuclear states there are, the more dangerous the situation is. But really, the greater danger is the danger posed by the original nuclear powers, the United States and Russia. Um, we worry a lot about Iran. They don't have a weapon. The Koreans, it's pretty bad. They could do a lot of damage with their nuclear weapons, but they don't have enough at this point to destroy the world. The United States and Russia do. And so I think we need to focus a lot on preventing proliferation, especially to terrorist groups. But we really need to appreciate that the heart of the problem is right here in the United States and in Russia. Um, sir, um, I just wondered what happened to your blood pressure when President Trump said in the campaign, what's the use of having nukes if we can't use them? <laughs> And it was a direct quote there. And my, my question is not intended to be smart-ass, but is there any hope? Is there anyone within this administration who has a sense of sanity that understands the gravity of this issue who might put a working paper on the president's desk? Well, in terms of my blood pressure, at the time that he made the statement, like everybody else, I assumed he wasn't going to win the election. So I, I wasn't as worried, perhaps, as I should have been. Um, we have a real problem with this administration. Uh, there are, the person who is viewed as the adult in the room is Mad Dog Mattis. Um, that's the most reasonable person in the current leadership. Uh, he does appear to understand how bad it would be to go to war in Korea, and he was opposed to tearing up the Iran agreement. But it's not clear how much he is calling the shots on policy at this point. He and Tillerson seemed to be on the same wavelength. Tillerson was forced out. Um, um, McMaster seemed to be more reasonable. He is forced out. And the team that's in place right now um, is really quite frightening. And there's no way around it. When you get to the problem of Trump himself, it's really complicated because we don't know what this man thinks on nuclear weapons. He said diametrically opposed things. He said that. Then he said he thought we needed to get rid of them all. Then he said we needed to have 10 times as many as we have. And I'm not sure he knows what he thinks about nuclear weapons. We certainly don't. Um, and that's why I, I really cite this as one of the eight factors which I think is really contributing to the danger of nuclear war right now. This is a very unstable um, administration at this point with regards to its nuclear policy. Uh, I have two, two things. One is a comment, and this is a follow-up of what Mike Moore was suggesting. And that, was, that is that we're in an election year right now, and we're in the middle of a lot of primaries. <coughs> And many of us are going to meetings with candidates. And I think we should all take the opportunity to bring this up to the candidates at the pro for the primary and then for those in the election for this fall. I think we've all got a, a, a responsibility to do that. A lot of us are going to fundraisers and things like that. And we've got the opportunity to go one-on-one. -on -one, and we should, we should take advantage of it. My question is, you had mentioned many t uh, that there were times that there were uh, errors that were made, and people thought that they were going to be that there, there was a, there was something happening right. nuclear wise with Russia or the United States. Could you explain that? Yeah, uh, th thanks, Margaret. It's a very good question and something which I probably should have talked about already. Um, even if we don't ever make it, if no nuclear state ever makes a decision to use nuclear weapons there is always the danger that there will be a war by accident. We know of at least six events in which either Moscow or Washington actually began the process of launching the nuclear arsenals in the mistaken belief that they were under attack by the other side. In May of uh, 1967, several of our early warning stations in Greenland were taken out by a solar flare. The US thought they had been taken out by, by the Soviets. And we actually had launched bombers and were sending them towards the Soviet Union when, when we found out what had actually happened. Um, in uh, 1979, somebody fed a uh, training tape into the uh, computers down at Cheyenne Mountain outside of uh, Colorado Springs. This was displayed on the screens as if it were real-time data, and it showed a massive Soviet attack uh, underway against the United States. Uh, we, again, began, we, we took the covers off the missile silos. We put missiles and uh, bombers in the air. Um, that went on for, I think, 12 minutes before they figured out what was going on. Uh, the next year, in 1980, a computer chip failed. And again, the US computers down at, uh, at NORAD headquarters. 
and we again thought we were under attack, although this was, seemed to be a smaller attack. Um, uh, three years later, in 1983, uh, in September, uh, Soviet radar station in southern Russia picked up what appeared to be a U.S. nuclear attack. Uh, the commander of that station did not believe it. He thought there was nothing going on that day that should have led to this. He made some calls to some other radar stations which were not picking up similar stuff, and he suppressed the report he was getting. He was later court-martialed for this. Uh, he's the subject of a movie called The Man Who Saved the World, which is a terrific movie. Um, two months after that, uh, there was a NATO exercise called Able Archer 83. Uh, every year, NATO used to have an exercise in which they would simulate a Soviet attack on Western Europe. Um, that year, as part of the exercise, they took all of the uh, heads of state out of their capitals to their rural command posts. The Soviets were terrified at that point. We had just deployed the Pershing missiles in Europe. They were convinced we were going to launch a surprise attack. And this is only 40 years after the Nazis launched their surprise attack against the Soviet Union, and they thought that the same thing was going to happen. They had decided that the key bit of data that would signal that the US really was going to attack was if all the heads of state were taken out of the capitals and brought to their rural command posts. And when they picked that up, they decided that it was going to happen, and they prepared to launch. They sent a message to all of the KGB station chiefs in Western Europe and told them we're about to attack. Destroy your documents and get out of your, out of your cities. Go to your rural route, you know, wherever they were supposed to go in the countryside. It so happened that the uh, KGB station chief in London was a double agent working for the British. <laughs> and he was able to get out of the embassy and contact his British handler and tell him what was going on. Margaret Thatcher, in the middle of the night, woke up Robert McFarlane, who was the US uh, national security advisor at the time, and got Reagan on the hotline um, with the Kremlin. And they were able to convince them that this was not the case. And it's part of the effort to convince them Ronald Reagan was put on the White House lawn with a dog to walk the dog for 20 minutes. So the Soviets, the embassy was on 16th Street, just up from the White House, could see that Reagan had not gone to his command post uh, outside of Washington. Um, the last one that we know about um, was in 1995, uh, six years after the end of the Cold War, when um, the US launched a weather satellite, a weather rocket, it wasn't a satellite, uh, from Norway. We advised the Russians that we were doing this, but somebody in Moscow did not pass word on to the appropriate people. And when Russian military radar saw this rocket had separated into four stages, they initially uh, interpreted this as four warheads coming towards Moscow in what would be the beginning of a decapitating strike to take out the, the Russian leadership. This is the only time that we know about during the nuclear weapons era when the, uh, the special briefcase, it's called the football, that the Russian leadership carries at all times to respond to nuclear attack was activated. And um, there were a, a, an array of options on what to do. Uh, Russian policy at the time, and US policy was the same, and it's still the same in both countries, is something called launch on warning. If you believe the other side has launched an attack on you, you don't wait for the missiles to land and take out your missiles. You launch them right away. And so what should have happened that morning was that the Russians should have started World War III. But they decided to wait, and we don't really know exactly what happened. Uh, Yeltsin was president of Russia at the time. As you may remember, he was an alcoholic. Um, he was disabled for days at a time by his drinking. And it is literally possible that he was too drunk to make a decision that morning, and that's why we're here today. The conditions that existed in terms of the kinds of command and control systems that enabled that near miss to take place have not substantially changed since then. The same kind of thing could unfold again today. Those are six instances that we know about. There are almost certainly more of them that have not been declassified, that have not made it into the public domain. The one um, with the computer, uh, the, the war game chip was fed into the computer. We know about that one because Senator Percy from Illinois was touring NORAD headquarters when it took place, and he talked to the press about it afterwards. So uh, you know, th there are probably other near misses that we don't know about. Um, but it is an extraordinary, I mean, if you look at this, at this situation, it literally defies analysis. It, it, this is, there's no way you can call this rational. Yeah. The people like us who favor the elimination of nuclear weapons, we're told that we're being unrealistic. I think the people who are being unrealistic are the people who think we can continue to maintain these arsenals indefinitely and have nothing go wrong. I mean, our luck is not going to hold out forever. So I had a question for you. 
Uh, you've eloquently discussed the threat of nuclear warfare. Would you also comment on the problem of nuclear waste disposal? Well, yeah, I mean, we have created this entire category of, of, of toxic materials through our nuclear enterprise, the building of the weapons and preparing the fuel for nuclear power reactors. Um, these nuclear wastes are extraordinarily toxic and very, very long-lived. They decay very slowly. Uh, plutonium in particular um, you know, has a radioactive half-life of 24,000 years, which means it remains dangerous for a half a million years. We built this with an incredible hubris. I mean, all of human history goes back like six, 7,000 years, and we have taken upon ourselves the task of safeguarding from the environment these toxic materials for a period of 500,000 years. I mean, there have been three ice ages in the last 500,000 years. We have no idea what this planet is going to look like in that time frame. And we don't have a good answer at this point. Um, it, it is a problem which we need to address. Uh, I think it is, we need to not have a nuclear war first so that we are around to address that problem. But it is one of the real problems that, that, that we are leaving to our children. I want to follow up on the nuclear power issue. Jim Hansen proposes a large increase in nuclear power for climate reasons, carbon-free. How would, how would you react to that? Um, it, it, I don't understand why he puts that forward. It's a, it's a very, very bad idea for many reasons. Um, f from a, a, a nuclear point of view, nuclear power it, it poses unacceptable risks of catastrophic accidents like Fukushima, Chernobyl. Um, it creates the enormous amounts of radioactive waste that we don't know how to deal with. Most importantly, perhaps, it is the, the technology that enables a country to build a nuclear power infrastructure also enables it to build a nuclear weapon. And the more we promote nuclear power around the world, the more we increase the chance of nuclear weapons proliferation. But from his point of view, from concern about climate change, it's also a terrible idea. Nuclear power is incredibly expensive. Every dollar that we spend on nuclear power would generate five times more electricity if we spent it on renewables or on conservation. And so, uh, you know, by putting money into nuclear power, we're really exacerbating the climate problem because we're diverting resources that we desperately need to put into other kinds of, of, of energy sources. I think I know the answer to this already, but uh, in your opinion, can the use of nuclear weapons ever be justified? For example, Truman's decision to drop the bomb when he thought he would be saving millions of lives. Um, well, I don't think Truman thought he was saving millions of lives when he did it, is the problem. Um, you know, the argument that was given at the time was that we needed to use the bomb to end the war. Um, I think it's been pretty well documented at this point that the Japanese were frantically trying to surrender before we dropped the bomb in Hiroshima, um, and that we knew that. Um, they still hadn't been willing to concede that uh, giving up the emperor, which we ultimately agreed they didn't have to do. That was the sticking point. But the negotiations were well underway at that point. Uh, the bomb wasn't dropped on Hiroshima to end the war. It was dropped on Hiroshima to scare the Russians. And um, no, I don't think it was justified. Um, I also don't think that's really, uh, th this, is, this is an issue which is enormously divisive in, in the United States. And I usually don't bring it up because people who lived through World War II believe that this saved millions of lives. And it's just not the most productive conversation to have even if it were legitimate to end World War II, any future use of this weapon it, it will cause unimaginable suffering. We're never going to use one nuclear weapon again. If any nuclear power uses nuclear weapon state uses a nuclear weapon, it will be more than one that gets used. And in all probability, it will be a large number that get used. And the kind of catastrophe that I've been describing will take place. When the US used a war game, um, scenarios in which they would use a single nuclear warhead uh, in, in Europe. And the US policy back in the 80s was that if the Soviets came in large numbers uh, into Western Europe, into West Germany, we would respond early on by using tactical nuclear weapons because we were going to be outgunned with conventional forces. When they did war games to look at what would happen, every single time we used a single nuclear warhead, it escalated into all-out nuclear war. And this has salience at the moment. Because the Russians, paradoxically, have adopted the same strategy that we had in the 80s, 
they have a policy now called escalatory de-escalation, um, in which it is the plan of, of the Russian government, if they get into a fighting, shooting war with NATO, that early on in that conflict, they will use tactical nuclear weapons on the battlefield in an attempt to shock and, and awe us into stopping the war. And I don't know if they've done wargaming on this, but the wargaming that we did back in the 80s would suggest that this will not stop the war. It will lead to a large-scale nuclear war. Hey, thank you very much for these insights this evening. Would it be, um, or would there be any consideration to perhaps using a lot more of the um, tools and, and resources that might be available in social media to get a lot more grassroots awareness and a call to action. So using technology and yeah. social media for these uh, yeah. uh, important a Absolutely. Aspects. You know, we are hoping that the campaign back from the brink will go viral. Um, the freeze back in the 80s actually did go viral at a time when the term didn't exist and the internet and social media didn't exist. We have these tools now and we really need to use them. Um, I'm like most people of my age, I'm not very good at social media, and I'm really relying on the younger people who are bringing into this movement to help us figure out how to make best use of them. Uh, but I think they're going to be uh, absolutely essential to getting the word out. We need, we need to educate an entire generation who know nothing about nuclear war. Um, you know, people of my age, for the most part, know, knew something, we've tended to forget it. Um, younger people were never taught this stuff. And they really don't know. I do an exercise when I, when, if I teach like a college class, I hand out a piece of paper and I ask everybody to write down how many nuclear weapons they, th they think there are in the world. And I get the same results almost every time I do this. The range is from zero to 100. There are actually 15,000. These are bright college kids who've come to hear me talk because they're interested in the issue. And they know nothing about it. So we have an enormous job to do educating people. The, the context in which the political action of the 1980s took place was a highly informed citizenry. People knew about nuclear weapons and they were terrified of nuclear war. And we need to recreate that. Um, I, you know, we're, we're criticized sometimes for fear-mongering, for unnecessarily frightening people. But the fact of the matter is, fear is a very useful emotion. Uh, it is what gets us to avoid dangerous things. We're afraid of heights, so we don't jump off the of 30-story buildings. Um, we need to be afraid of things that pose a legitimate threat, a real threat to us. And we need people to be more frightened of nuclear weapons than they are. In the 80s, if you asked people, what are the most important problems in the world today, number one or number two on everybody's list was nuclear war. If you ask that, people, that question to people today, nuclear war isn't on most people's list. And so we really need to use social media and we need to use popular culture. We need to get movies made again about nuclear war. And, and then we need to do a lot of talking like this, and we need to get lots of people adopting the resolution so that that becomes a news story and a buzz, um, so that we get people to understand again in large numbers um, that this issue, that this threat is real, and that they need to do something about it. Our next question is... Yeah, are the, <coughs> excuse me, are there any senators or representatives that you can mention that are behind this effort? And I was thinking of Carl Sagan and... Bertrand Russell, because I was in the anti-nuclear march in 62 in D.C. when 10,000 people marched on Washington. So this has been with us a long time. Same nuclear rally I went to. It's the first political activity I did. It still lives with me today. Mm -hmm. But I'm just wondering about, is there any celebrity? I was thinking of like Prince Harry getting married on Saturday or, or Prince William. Someone like that or Princess Di was out there. Someone like that, you're a wonderful person, but we need somebody of that kind of stature yep. to be a spokesperson for this kind of an issue and to rally up maybe the nine countries that have the weapons and have a summit. Um, there, that's a great point. Um, there, is, there are a number of people in the Congress uh, who are champions of this issue. Uh, my Senator Ed Markey um, has been for decades working on nuclear issues. And he is the author of the Senate version of legislation that would end the president's unchecked authority to launch nuclear war. Companion legislation has been introduced in the House by Congressman Ted Lieu from uh, Los Angeles. Um, it's a relatively small group of people at this point who are focusing on this issue. 
It's part of our strategy is to identify other champions in the Congress. We don't actually expect Congress as an institution to play the critical role in this. Um, Congress never has played the critical role in nuclear policy. Um, they could play an important role in not funding um, the, the $1.7 trillion buildup. But what they really can do is what you were suggesting. They can become public, visible spokespeople. During the Vietnam War, for example, Congress never actually ended the war, but there were many senators and representatives who were real uh, champions of the movement and who played a terribly important role in, in rallying public support and drawing attention to it. Uh, we have been talking for years about who the Princess Di for this movement could be. Uh, she played an incredibly important role in the landmines campaign. Um, people have talked about approaching um, the current young royals to see if they would do this. Um, also, there are a few people in the entertainment community. Michael Douglas has, has spoken out a lot on this issue. He hasn't achieved quite the notoriety uh, or the effectiveness that, say, Leonardo DiCaprio has on climate issues. But yeah, yeah I mean, that's, it, there's a real awareness that we need to get people like this. We need to come up with more celebrities, because that's the kind of culture we live in, uh, who will really draw attention to this issue. Uh, yes, um, uh, I read uh, online that one of the chief inspectors, a Finn, I can't remember his name, uh, quit right after Trump said he was withdrawing. Uh, I don't know why he quit. He didn't mention why, uh, but also, we all know Trump says that the Iranians are in violation of the treaty. I don't know what his evidence is. The inspections have all said there was no violation. He has offered no evidence. He's just made the assertion um, that, that is you know, a style of, of argument where you just repeat something over and over again and don't offer evidence for it. Um, everything that we know is that the Iranians are, have been in full compliance with the treaty. Uh, and this seems to be an utterly gratuitous creation of a new crisis that we did not need to create, um, but we've done it. Um, I want to build on the previous question, because when we talk about celebrities, we talk about Congress people who might be leaders. I think what's happening is perhaps it's becoming a partisan issue when it needs to be Republicans, Democrats, independents, and we need to find some people on both sides who can understand the science and be as afraid as we are. There are some. Um, so I, my question yep. is, are, are there some overtures or some support yep. that are non-political that might get some of the um, Trump supporters, perhaps, to understand our danger? Well, there have been some very, very prominent Republicans who have called for the abolition of nuclear weapons in recent years. Uh, Henry Kissinger and George Shultz, to name the two most important. Unfortunately, they're both very elderly and unable to do a lot of, of public uh, you know, campaigning and sp speechifying about this. Um, before that, the, there were people like Lee Butler, the former commander of the Strategic Air Command, um, who has never explicitly said that he's Republican, but clearly is. Colin Powell has called for the abolition of nuclear weapons. Um, it, it, the, the phenomenon that you're pointing to, the, the polarization of, of the political uh, discourse about this, is very troubling because um, the Congressional Republican Party um, has really turned its back on the Republican security experts. Um, and they don't really put forward an argument uh, contrary to what the experts are saying. They simply say, we're not going to do this, and say that it's, you know, they repeat that the Iranians are in violation when they offer no evidence for it. I don't know what the answer to that is. Um, we do look all the time for Republicans in Congress and other Republican leaders uh, to try to get them uh, to speak out on this. Uh, not particularly successful when it comes to the congressional wing of the Republican Party. And um, ultimately, we're going to need to do that. Because if we're going to have a treaty, we need two-thirds vote in the Senate. And it's highly unlikely that either party will ever again have a two-thirds majority in the Senate. So it's going to have to be bipartisan. Uh, we have had countries voluntarily give up their nuclear weapons. Yes. South Africa is the one that comes to mind, and I believe Kazakhstan is the other. Both countries had absolutely no reason on earth to have these nuclear weapons. The two countries right now who have absolutely no reason on earth 
to have nuclear weapons of Britain and France. Uh, is there anything going on in the attempt to end their national pride, as it were, uh, to get rid of their weapons and maybe be the uh, catalyst for the rest? Um, they're very different in, in, in where they stand at the moment. Uh, the UK is, of all the nuclear weapon states, the one which is most likely to give up its arsenal for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that the Labour Party, uh, the leader of the Labour Party, um, favors giving up their nuclear weapons. And if Labour wins the next election, it is possible that he will be able to move this through Parliament. The other reason is that all of the UK's nuclear weapons are stationed at a base near Glasgow in Scotland. And uh, there is overwhelming opposition to this to the possession of nuclear weapons in Scotland. And if Scotland uh, does secede uh, from the UK, uh, it will not allow the UK to station its nuclear fleet in Glasgow. And it turns out that for reasons which I don't fully understand, there is no other suitable port in the entire United Kingdom where these submarines can be stationed. And so they're either going to have to spend an enormous amount of money to build a port uh, or they're going to have to station them here in the United States, and then they're no longer UK weapons, really. So the UK is is one of the is, it, it, it's very important, and we focus a lot of energy, uh, the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, on the UK. France is quite different. Uh, the French um, affection for the nuclear arsenal is perhaps the strongest of all the nuclear weapon states, maybe being challenged now by the Russians. Uh, this, the force de frappe, this is part of la gloire de la France, it's, it, it, it's totally irrational. I mean, France does not need these weapons for its security any more than Italy or Germany need nuclear weapons, and they quite sanely have determined that they don't. Um, but France's standing in the world as a great power, in its own eyes at least, is tied intimately to its nuclear arsenal. And I think it's going to be very, France is going to be one of the harder cells among nuclear weapon states, despite the fact that they are completely under the U.S. nuclear umbrella. They don't need to have an independent uh, arsenal. And it's hard to figure out why they spend all this time and money on maintaining it. Great question. Thanks. One more question. You said Congress is supposed to be in control of nuclear weapons. How did that get transferred to the president? Well, it's largely a function of the Cold War. You know, during the Cold War, we were afraid that there was going to be a sudden attack by the Soviets. And so you obviously weren't going to have time to have a debate in Congress whether we should go to war or not. And it just came increasingly to be ceded to the presidency to have this power. Up until uh, World War II, every war that the United States fought was declared by Congress. Korea was not. That was the first. That was called a police action, not a war. It clearly was a war. But Congress never declared war. Uh, in Vietnam, we never declared war. We got a resolution authorizing the use of force in the Gulf uh, uh, during the first Gulf War, but there was never a formal declaration of war. And little by little, under the, the press of, of um, the, the threat posed by nuclear weapons during the Cold War, this power was just ceded by Congress. Um, and even the current legislation doesn't say that the president uh, does not deny the president the ability to launch nuclear weapons in response to an attack on the United States. It simply says he can't initiate the use of nuclear weapons if the United States has not been attacked with them. Um, but Congress, and Congress doesn't show a great deal of appetite for taking back this particular power. It's usually very, very jealous of its prerogatives. But on this, there is there's not a strong support at this point. The resolution, the Marky Lou legislation, was introduced first under President Obama. It had almost no co-sponsors then. Under President Trump, it has significantly more uh, co-sponsors, but not anywhere near uh, enough to, to pass it in either house, and certainly not enough to override a presidential veto, which would almost certainly happen. Um, so, yeah. Do we have an updated version of the Eisenhower 10, or do we assume destruction would be so great that we could not rebuild our infrastructure? Um, there may be people in the government who think that we could rebuild our infrastructure. I think that they're totally living in a different world than we are. Um, you know, there, if there's a large-scale war between the United States and Russia, not only will everything in this country be wrecked by the fires and the explosions, but we will then be subjected to a nuclear winter lasting for 20 years. We're not going to emerge as an organized society on the other end of that. Um, it will be something like the Stone Age, but in a, 
on a planet that has been terribly polluted, which has had its easily accessible resources greatly depleted. Um, there's a whole genre of post-apocalyptic literature, which I think is a much more accurate um, depiction of what the world will look like if there are survivors. And if, if people haven't read them, there are two wonderful books, uh, one called Ridley Walker, um, which is probably the better of the two. This is, a, this is a book which is set in the UK in the year 4200. Um, it's a little, it's not the most accessible book in the world because it's written in the language that is spoken, uh, the, the form of English that has evolved in the year 4200. Um, but it is, uh, it is an incredibly powerful evocation of, of how complete uh, the destruction of our civilization will be. Uh, and the other is a book which is more accessible called uh, Canticle for Leibowitz, uh, which is set here in the United States and, and visits the United States at three points in history, uh, around 2600, which is kind of like the Dark Ages, around 3100, which is kind of like the, 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 the Middle Ages, and around 3700, when modern industrial society has again emerged and people have again built nuclear weapons, which they are about to use. Um, uh, they're both of them, they're, they're very, very good books to read. You know, the stuff that I'm talking about tonight is obviously very depressing. Um, I am not a particularly depressed or pessimistic person, and it's very important that we not be. Um, the danger that we face is very real. If we don't get our act together, all these horrible things really are going to happen, and we need to understand that. But we also need to understand that, that we can change this, and we need to be hopeful about this, we need to, to be motivated and inspired by the huge success which we achieved in the 1980s and just dedicate ourselves to doing the work again. It's a bit of work. It's worth doing. If we don't do it, the consequences are going to be really bad. None of us is going to do this job all by ourselves, but each one of us really needs to pick up um, you know, the mantle and do that part of the job which is ours to do, which is paraphrasing rather poorly an old Yiddish proverb. Um, and if we do that, if each one of us you know, does that part of the job which is ours to do, we're going to get through this. Um, and I think we need to have that, that, that perspective. Um, one very final thought. Good note to end on, yes. One even last note. Um, when you leave the room tonight, the first thing that's going to happen is that you're going to forget every, start to forget everything that I said. And it's not just the usual process of inattention. There is an active erasure which takes place. This stuff that I've been talking about is very painful to think about. And the way human minds react to that is we push it out of mind. We don't think about the things that are painful. We think about the things that make us happy. It, it, it is understandable. It is correct. It, 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 it enables us to be sane in the face of this kind of threat. But please do not let it happen. Figure out how to keep this information in your mind doesn't have to be sitting there in the front of your face 24 hours a day, but it has to be someplace up in the front of your mind, the part that motivates your behavior, so that when you wake up every day and think about the things you're going to do that day, you, part of what you think about is, what am I going to do today to prevent nuclear war? And I think that's what happened in the 80s. Millions of people just spent a little bit of their time trying to figure out how to prevent nuclear war, and that's what we need to do again today. And if we do that, as I said, I think we will be successful. And um, you know, it'll be very nice 10 years from now to be able to look back and say, we saved the world again. Thanks Thank so much. you. Thank you.